Hello everyone, a very good morning and good afternoon to people in Europe. I'm very happy to welcome you today to this webinar on green transitions, catalyzing India-EU relations for a green future. I'm Annapurna Mitra. I lead the Green Transitions Initiative at the Observer Research Foundation, and we're very happy to be doing this series in partnership with the Portuguese Embassy in India. Of course, no matter what we're talking about today, the conversation always has to start with COVID. It's at the back of all our minds. And I think it's brought into focus, especially from the perspective of climate, the havoc that system systemic risks can create when you don't contain them in time. Right now, we're in the biggest global recession in decades, millions of job lo jobs lost and people in poverty. And if the climate crisis is allowed to reach its peak, we're going to confront way more than that. And I think that's the negative. On the positive side, the world is recognizing the need to be prepared. There have been a lot of developments over the last year which show a shift in the thinking of policymakers, especially but also companies, individuals, organizations. Net zero, for example, is now a mainstream phrase. It wasn't just two years ago. And we have today over 100 countries, thousands of companies with net zero emissions targets in place. Climate finance is growing rapidly. The technology is evolving rapidly. And I think most importantly, the whole narrative on you can have either sustainability or growth and these two are at cross purposes. This is changing. We have now the green growth story. It's clear that when we push towards building back better and greener, we can also create jobs, we can also stimulate growth and we can just have a better quality of life for citizens in all over the world. And both India and the EU have, of course, been at the forefront of climate action but from very different starting points. The European Union is a grouping of advanced economies, so the problem is decarbonizing existing systems and changing the whole structure of an economy. For India, which is still developing, the question is how do you chart a low carbon development path? It's never been done before, and suddenly we're at this historic juncture where we need to reach our growth job development targets without emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And while both the EU and India are working a lot, we're working at different directions or we're working for different priorities. I want the different directions. And why we're here today is actually to figure out what is being done, what more can be done. But most importantly, I think, what can we do together? And to talk about this, I'm delighted to have with me two very distinguished panelists. The first is Mr. Girish Sethi. He's Senior Director Energy at the Energy and Resources Institute, one of India's preeminent think tanks in this field. He has over 15 years of experience and currently he leads and manages the program on promoting efficiency in the industrial sector, both large industries, but more importantly, I think in the Indian context, also small and medium enterprises. And we have with us Mr. Nuno Lacasta, he is CEO of the Portuguese Environment Agency and has been working in this field for about 20 years, both in Europe and in the United States. He has earlier served as Bureau Member of the European Environment Agency and as Chair of the OECD Environment Policy Committee. Thank you very much, both of you, for joining us, and I'm very keen to hear what both of you have to say. So for our audience, I'll first start with about 10 minutes of opening remarks from both our panelists, and then we'll be open to questions from the floor. You can put your questions in the chat box. And of course, we hope that there'll be avenues for uh, both participants to answer them. Let me start though right now with Mr. Sethi. Over to you, sir. And uh, you have about 10 minutes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Annapurna. It's a privilege to be part of this opening uh, panel discussion, which you are hosting uh, on behalf of the Portuguese embassy here in India. And uh, uh, it's good to join this panel discussion along with Mr. Uh, Lacosta from the Environment Agency in Portugal. Uh, on, on the subject of uh, greening the transition, uh, I think I would just like to spend the next uh, 10 minutes or so uh, talking from the perspective of India, 
uh, what we have been uh, doing over the last few years, last few decades, let me say in that context and what exactly is the pathway which we would like to see India moving on. I think you in your opening remarks did mention that we as a developing country need to have these green pathways and that's where I just wanted to focus in my uh, initial remarks. Uh, so if uh, we look at the overall uh, partnership between India and the European Union, we do have a very strong partnership in many areas in the area of uh, climate change, energy. We have, I think, the clean energy partnership going on between the Euro European Union and India and the strategic partnership dialogues have been happening on a regular basis between EU and India. But if we really look at uh, the future pathways, I would like to uh, probably put them into three broad pillars. The first one could be on the uh, decarbonization of the electricity sector, the power sector in India, which would also include the role of renewable energy. Uh, the second could be a very important topic which you also raised at the start because as a country we are growing, we are a developing country, our requirements are increasing and there is a huge focus on new industries, the infrastructure development, urbanization, uh, development of ports. So our large heavy industries are going to increase. So how do we really decarbonize these harder to obey sectors, so-called what we have been talking about globally nowadays. And also the larger story on energy efficiency, which is an extremely important element as we move forward in the mitigation curve. So if uh, I can just uh, spend a couple of minutes on each of these three uh, broad topics and then uh, take up any questions which you or the other uh, colleagues might have. So if we really look at from a supply side, from the electricity side, India has really made substantial progress in many areas. I think all these areas, uh, the penetration of uh, RE in the electricity generation uh, mix has been increasing. We are today close to 10% of the total uh, RE generation. So this is not in terms of the capacity. This is in terms of the actual RE which is getting into the grid. So that's very important to note. And uh, today uh, globally it is recognized that India is one of the lowest producers of solar uh, energy when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing. So we today already have bids uh, which is in the range of in, in rupee terms close to two rupees per unit kilowatt hour. Uh, that is of course when the sun is shining and similarly for uh, the wind we are close to around 2.4 for the lowest bids which have come in. So this has all been possible because of the policy push uh, by the government of India over the last so many years and by the uh, announcements by the government of India of a very, very ambitious target uh, of uh, which Prime Minister Modi announced uh, at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019 in September 2019 of 450 gigawatt of uh, IE by 2030. So all this is well within reach uh, and uh, we can also say that Presently, everything is talk, being talked about like the solar and the wind is only when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, as I mentioned. But I think some of the recent initiatives which have been taken by the government of India, uh, where they have invited the recent bids for the implementation of solar plus storage of close to around 1200 megawatt, that also yielded tariff rates of close to around rupees 4 per kilowatt hour uh, for implementation in another three years or so. And that really is very encouraging news, I would think when you're talking about round the clock or the firm power to be available. So uh, that is on the RE side, which is on the positive side. But if one really looks at the opportunities and how one can move forward, looking at how uh, things are happening in Europe, in large economies in Europe, whether it is in Germany or in UK, where they have made substantial progress. We all know that renewable energy is a variable renewable energy. It is not static like the way we used to have we have the coal power plants or hydro plants so the variation of uh, what we call it as vre so integration of this variable renewable energy is a big challenge we at terry of course have done lots of studies the modeling studies and the simulation studies and that clearly shows that yes up to 35 to 40 percent is cost effective one can actually get into that and this is easily possible by 2030 or so 
but when uh, one has to go beyond these figures, yes, there are technical challenges and this is something where we can really learn from how uh, the grids in, in Europe, how they are managing, how they are moving forward. Of course, there are differences in the way the seasons and all those things are there, but still there is a lot what can be learned through knowledge sharing and exchange of ideas in that regard. The, uh, the second uh, pillar which I just wanted to touch briefly was, um, as I mentioned, uh, the large decarbonization opportunities which lie for these harder to abate sectors as we call it. Uh, sectors like steel and cement, because if the country is going to grow at 8 to 9 percent, 8 to 10 percent, we are talking about a 5 trillion economy. I think you know it better. Anupuna. So I think you basically need all these key raw materials which go into infrastructure development, whether it is steel or cement or even plastics, aluminium, all these things. And all these things come from virgin raw material and these are energy intensive processes. So if we are going to lock our uh, new in industries into old technologies, then we are uh, not really doing justice to this whole discussion on climate change and, and uh, moving towards low carbon pathways. So I think it's here again the second topic which I wanted that yes, the technology development traditionally has been happening quite a lot in the developed countries like Europe and all these countries, Germany, Sweden. So when one is trying to go in for new technologies, there are opportunities for research and development collaboration which can happen between the two uh, regions, uh, whether it is the academic uh, and industry or university exchanges where one can work together towards the development of these technologies and issues related to technology transfer and know-how transfer. So I would rather call it know-how and know-why transfer how the technologies are being developed and how they can be deployed at mass scale uh, as we are going to expand. For example, the national steel policy in India talks about uh, almost two and a half times, three times uh, the capacity of steel in India in another 10 years. So we are today close to around 100 million tons of steel. So imagine since independence, we have got 100 million tons and we are talking about in another 10 years, we'll be having adding another 110, 120 million tons of capacity. So this is where I think it's important to see that we can get the best technologies which are available internationally for deployment in, 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 in India. And the, this is just one example to illustrate the point which I was referring to. Uh, coming to the third uh, major uh, subject, which I think is extremely important, which is rather one could call it as a low hanging fruits. So that's around energy efficiency. And I think that's an extremely important element. India has made huge progress in this regard. One of the India's uh, nationally determined contributions talks about reduction in the energy intensity uh, by 2030. So we are well on track to meet that. In fact, going to exceed that. So huge progress has been made in many of these areas. Uh, but what is more important also is to see that what more can be done in that area. Uh, some of the uh, sectors like cement or many others like ammonia, we are as good as any other uh, country in the world, whether it is Europe or US in terms of the energy consumption patterns. But in many other areas, we are not that good. So I think it's in these areas that there are opportunities for collaboration in which again exist, uh, whether it is in, in terms of uh, uh, the new uh, technologies or the practices even. We are into the digital age and how we can monitor and control and measure these emissions, measure energy in, in these in, uh, enterprises. And you started uh, your uh, this panel discussion by talking about COVID and green recovery. Uh, I, I guess this is the most important for a sector like um, the small and the medium enterprises. Uh, we have got close to 100 million people in this country working in this sector. And if we are going to ensure that uh, these, and this is the backbone of the Indian economy, employing so many people and expanding again at a very high rate. So one will have to ensure that the new technologies of expansion in these uh, smaller companies is green. Finance needs to be available. God of India has done an exemplary job over the last few months after the uh, COVID, during the first COVID recovery, they, they came out with some collateral uh, free loans and packages. But yes, a lot more is needed to ensure that the recovery in, in these enterprises is 
just and uh, the uh, impact of uh, the covid on job losses and all gets reduced so i think these are the three major areas which i just felt it would be important to just initially touch on of course there are many other areas where india is making huge progress uh, when it comes to the greening the transition the biggest example of the last two years or so three years we have been talking about is the transport sector there is a huge discussion and lots of uh, schemes by the government of india by the state governments for example by the city government of delhi where we live they have come up with this they are calling it as i think the electric switch or something a new campaign for the consumers to move from ic engines to electric vehicles whether it is the two wheelers or the three wheelers or battery electric vehicles so there is a huge push happening in that area but lot more needs to be done in many other areas i think and i look forward to any further discussions or comments from your side thank you thank you very much mr sethi that's a very clear encapsulation of what's happening in india right now and what can be done and i will come back to you in a bit especially to talk about target setting because you mentioned how important target setting has been in the rd sector and what more can we do but first let me ask mr lakasta to make his opening remarks and you have about 10 minutes minutes mr lakasta and i hope you'll focus on roughly the same theme so what portugal and the european union is doing and of course avenues for co collaboration over to you well thanks very much indeed good morning good afternoon um it's it's a great pleasure to be able to participate in, the, in this exchange uh, of experiences forum uh, i think it's very timely um uh, and with that i would like to first start by, uh, by congratulating the events partners the observation research institute the embassy of portugal in new delhi and the diplomatic institute um, portugal is currently holding its fourth six months eu presidency since joining the european union in 1986. as it turns out we we're once more focused on climate policy and actions at the european level back in 1992 during our first presidency participants will recall the un uh, rio conference on environment and development at which time the un climate change convention was adopted um, today i'll brief you very uh, on uh, several policy and action developments in the eu and also touch upon uh, collaboration avenues Allow me first, therefore, however, to make a very uh, quick historical of reflection, if I may. You mentioned earlier um, that I've been working on climate policy for over 20 years. It, it's hard to, to believe indeed. But I started working back in 1996, almost two years before the adoption of the Kyoto Protocol. Protocol. That's when I started dwelling into climate change. And my boss at the time told me something along the lines of, Nuno, I think you should go pursue this subject because it may very well be the subject you'll be working on for the remaining of your professional life. And I think he was very uh, uh, truth about that. Um, um, but I, one thing I recall is India's unmatched leadership at the time, and it still continues, on the so-called issue of, of climate equity. At the time, a lot of people, this was a pretty protracted decision among so-called developed and developing countries, but India was very clear all the time that, listen, first and foremost, we must focus on industrialized countries historical contribution to the problem and of course we're mindful of the fact that as a result of that we need to develop now and what is it that's happened over the course of the last 20-25 years um, it's a mixed picture on the developed so-called developed country side you see europe indeed engaging with the subject and becoming a world leader on decarbonization of course some of it might is a result of offshoring of industries to be sure but clearly Europe has decoupled economic growth from uh, carbon emissions. That is not the case in the United States, as we all know. Polit policy hesitancy over the last couple of decades have not really tapped the potential for the US economy in that regard. Uh, but India, and, and you mentioned earlier, whether one country can, any country can indeed grow economically and also do so on low carbon. I would argue that India is an example of that because whatever happens in India, whatever course corrections may be uh, uh, coming up, as we all do uh, as humans, the fact is that Indian economy will never become 
in terms of uh, uh, fossil fuel use will never become like the industrialized world's e economy uh, in historical terms. It will it, that will never be the case because we already only bear a couple of decades discussing uh, like, like as we've heard earlier and I fully agree massive investments on renewable energy and low carbon uh, power gen. Uh, 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 huge challenges in, in terms of grid management and indeed Europe has some lessons on that, some painful lessons on that, but some successful ones as well. R&D collaboration in industrial sectors, particularly as we move towards industrial processes reconversion as we speak, because people are realizing that's also a, a competitiveness tool rather than just uh, uh, technology exporting uh, sort of uh, approach. So. In that sense, I'm encouraged to what we're seeing uh, across the globe. Actually, because most of the of our human fellows live in countries outside the so-called Western world, and we haven't even began talking about uh, Africa's rise. So the story of the last 20 years is that of unprecedented, pre unprecedented economic rise, um, which we now must draw lessons for. for. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, an initial stage is, is fueled by fossil fuels, as we should expect. And that is why, as a bare fact, 40% of the world's emissions have occurred, global concentrations have occurred in the last uh, uh, couple of decades as well. So this has become, as many of us would know, uh, a global problem that all of us must address. And indeed, increasingly, we're seeing that being the case. Um, but also, we're all becoming keenly aware of the impact of climate change. We're mostly talking about reducing emissions, but all our countries are vulnerable. India is particularly vulnerable. Just recently, we've heard yet again uh, uh, some uh, 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 um, reports of huge flooding. Uh, we're seeing forest fires across the globe. Portugal is particularly vulnerable in that regard. Um, heat waves and, of course, pandemics. Uh, Pandemics are exacerbated also by climate uh, uh, challenges. So uh, we're all vulnerable. Uh, so we need to also start focusing on, on adaptation. Um, so I would argue that moving forward, economic development is, is strictly linked with decarbonization. Those that do not do so may very well take a couple of, of decades even, or even a decade of initial development, then they will stall. Those that, on the other hand, start decoupling, and we're seeing that in China, and we began seeing that in India, perhaps even earlier than China, given its uh, potential on renewable energy. It's not long ago that India's become uh, uh, number one country, even before China took over, on uh, renewable energy production. That is not by chance. That it's because it's a technology which is more amenable oftentimes to countries which are uh, earlier developing uh, high tech and, uh, and deployment. Um, so, yeah, we certainly have seen that economic development uh, and decarbonization can go hand in hand. Uh, my, therefore, my, my answer, first answer is, can India continue developing and dramatically reduce pollution and carbon emissions? I think yes. I think there is no alternative, incidentally, because for instance of air pollution. Um, are we already seeing mutually beneficial decarbonization job creation examples at scale? I believe we are beginning to do so. We need to do much more. This is where cooperation, I think, could play a role. Uh, can India, and indeed as a result, can India and Europe enhance cooperation? I believe we can. Uh, very quickly now on briefing uh, participants on European Union developments. Um, just last December, only a few days after the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement uh, adoption, the EU submitted an upgraded um, climate target. It's now at least 55% in relation to 1990 levels by 2030. This is, by all accounts, the most ambitious climate target in the world. And it's commensurate to the 2% or even 1.5% uh, global greenhouse gas uh, sorry, uh, global temperatures stabilization by the end of the century. This means Europe has, uh, as a result, embarked upon the trajectory of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. This is our policy goal. Uh, 
This is something we will do also, incidentally, because it's in our economic interest. We are particularly dependent on imports of um, energy, fossil fuels particularly, and as a result, this is in our economic interest, uh, to be sure. Um, and it's also a signal that we are delivering what the Paris Agreement said we should every so often in terms of upgrading targets. We've seen encouraging signals from uh, several other countries, several including major emitters, and we should take that on for uh, coming year uh, in view of the uh, Glasgow uh, Climate Conference later in the year. Uh, but also, of course, as you may know, and you mentioned, Europe is now focused on so-called green transition, the European Green Deal, which is an economic strategy, I would argue, first and foremost. And on that front, there are sweeping measures already on the table. The first one, which I should highlight, it's the European climate law. So we're enshrining into EU law for the first time, this notion of carbon neutrality and these ambitious targets. But we're also deploying increasing measures on the transportation, on the housing sector, on emissions trading. I don't think it was mentioned earlier, but I think it's very relevant because if there's one lesson we can draw from the European Union's experience, importing a US idea, I should say, is that we need to set targets. Without targets, there's only uh, scant movement. Once we set targets, and we can debate whether they're ambitious enough, but the fact is that they get people moving. And that's what's happened in Europe. People start moving. The order of merit between coal and even natural gas early on has been reversed. And nowadays what we're seeing in Europe and several other OECD countries is a dash towards uh, decommissioning coal-fired power plants. Again, it's an economic interest, but it's also uh, a, a very uh, a, a important measure because on the one hand, it gives an additional shelf life to uh, gas-fired power plants, which are of course lower carbon than coal, but also it allows for renewable, en renewable energies to penetrate at scale once again. Portugal is a very good example of that, but several other countries in Europe have begun doing so. And this brings me to additional cooperation. India has been fostering a solar, solar alliance. Prime Minister Modi has been a leader on that. I believe that's a very promising uh, initiative, uh, also because it's a realization that India can lead in that regard in terms of deployment of scale, worldwide deployment of this technology, which is essentially mature nowadays, and it's only going to be so. I remember just a few years ago where we had 300 euros per megawatt hour of solar, and nowadays it's a fraction of that. And indeed, Portugal has been a country which has recently done a solar auction, which has become the most competitive and uh, 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 successful really in the world, where for the first time, uh, the price was, was uh, absolutely competitive. And what it means is that we have for the, for the first time, Italy has, has also done that, a sharing of benefits between consumers and energy producers in terms of the uh, price there. So I believe this is very interesting. I see this happening across the world as we go forward. But I think also very important, I'll be uh, ending very soon, is that we're realizing that the post-COVID-19 recovery plans and measures are aligned with the Green Deal objectives and decarbonization. I think that's very important because everybody's realizing that this time around, perhaps unlike the 2008 financial crisis, financial support stimulus packages must be freely at scale and must indeed reinforce policy objectives, which was probably not the case last time. And the money must flow to consumers rather than only to the financial sector. And as a result, in Europe, uh, the um, financial packages are on the table, which are massive, uh, are indeed mutually reinforcing between carbon, uh, uh, low emissions and, uh, and economic growth. This also means, incidentally, that financing, which is mostly private, may be slightly skewed for initial years between private towards more public funding, as these stimulus packages are indeed public funding. But again, they will need to be leveraged with financial, uh, um, with, with private funding. Um, in terms of uh, cooperate, international cooperation, the European Union and its member states are fully committed to the collective goal of mobilizing 
100 billion US dollars per year by 2020 uh, and through 2025, again, both public and private. And we'll be seeing, I'm absolutely sure, uh, uh, increasing increased uh, uh, pledges in that regard all th throughout this year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, solar investments and solar leadership, India is a, is a great example of, of that, um, but also in terms of industry, as was mentioned earlier. I think Indi India is a great example of a country where technologies which, frankly, oftentimes we didn't even fathom could, it, could even be de developed, have been developed, have been deployed at scale over the last 20, 10 to 15 years. You mentioned steel, cement, and a few other industries where, in fact, India is already a world leader. In fact, there are Indian multinationals which now own a lot of cement companies in Europe, I, I should say, as we all know, and steel as well. So this is something which we need to reinforce in terms of business exchanges, because as we speak, and in Portugal, we're seeing this again, we're speaking with companies and in these sectors, also a strong sector in Portugal is pulp and, pulp and paper and, and, and uh, technologies. And we're seeing these companies as, are rushing today to change in their industrial processes, both electrifying their ovens, both completely changing their chem chemical makeup of industrial processes because they realize that's how they will remain competitive going forward. There is, of course, a lifestyle issue here which hasn't been mentioned, but I, I cannot haste, uh, hesitate to mention it, it must be primarily for so-called Western and developed countries, because there is no way we can be sustainable given current consumption patterns. I think we're beginning to see a shift, uh, one which I uh, fear is only too modest, uh, but I see this is something which we can work upon going forward. So to finalize, Green transition and uh, um, carbon neutrality is becoming, I believe, a global take up. We just heard, for instance, China's announcement in that regard. I think other announcements will follow suit. But, all, but that's because people are realizing that that is the, the smartest way to setting people on a course which is meaningful and changes behavior rather than talking the talk and not walking the walk. And I think that's very relevant uh, cooperation in that regard is very uh, relevant. And I'll finish with recalling that the 15th EU India summit, was, which was held in the summer of 2020, where both sides leaders, European Union President uh, van der Leyen, uh, uh, for instance, and the Council President there, Prime Minister Modi, reaffirmed their commitment to strengthen EU India strategic partnership, uh, to adopt a common roadmap to guide their action and uh, put forward a joint declaration on resource efficient efficiency in the circular economy. I think we're all ready to work together. And I think therefore to conclude that this, this was a timely exchange in that regard. Thanks very much. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. And, uh, and very, uh, very, I'm sorry, I think I'm sorry. Some, I think I'm, um, let me try again. Try. Um, basically, thank you very much for your comments. And I wanted just to touch upon, I think, what I saw in both your remarks and very important, which is the question of setting targets. Of course, as you said, Mr. Sethi, India has ambitious targets and is well on its way to meeting them by 2030. But there are those who say that these targets could be made much more ambitious and there's much more to be done. So I just wanted your thoughts on you know, one, how, sh what form should a more ambitious target set? Should India also be on a net zero path? And if so, by how much? Or is it a different um, sort of set of policies you're looking at? So should we be looking, for example, at sectoral targets or picking one sector at a time? And I'd love to have your thoughts on this. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, um one does hear these kind of uh, discussions uh, in, in various forums and also through online platforms and discussions. <clears throat> See, it's the, uh, I would like to put it in a different perspective. Uh, the, the, the point here is that as a country, we are yet to reach our peaking. And what is important for us 
basically is that all the infrastructure which we need to develop has to be developed in a manner that it is from in a way which is least carbon intensive. That's the way it is. So when I touched in my discussions earlier in my intervention, when I talked about these sectors, which uh, was uh, also uh, reflected uh, when Mr. Lacoste had mentioned, see the sectors like steel and cement. In one case in cement, we are probably I would think today when you look at the energy intensity targets as a sector of cement. Probably the most efficient plants. Globally are today in India. For cement manufacturing in terms of kilowatt hour per ton of cement produced or kilo calories or kilo joules per ton of cement produced. But at the same time, maybe the most efficient plant is there, but the average is not the lowest. So you really need to bring the averages down. The second is. You, we talked about steel. I think he mentioned that many of the Indian steel companies are very, very active in Europe, and I think we can name it Tata Steel, people with the Indian origin, Arsenal Mithal, and uh, we have the Liberty House, and quite a few of these large big steel companies are active in Europe. But one can say that many of the steel plants in India are still not the best in terms of efficiency levels, even today. So there is a lot which can be done to reduce the efficiency levels in these plants. But as we expand in India, you need to ensure that the new plants which are are available with the best technologies available. So when you, it comes to the target setting when you're asking, so of course one can always argue this is very low. One can go beyond and there is every likelihood today that the energy intensity target of India, which was set for the NDC India is going to go far beyond that. Same way, I think, but the, at the same time, we also hear these discussions from many of the uh, experts. Uh, for example, we had Terry hosted the World Sustainable Development Summit uh, last week, and uh, we heard uh, even uh, John Kerry mentioning. I was there in that. Uh, I was listening to that. He mentioned that the target of 450 gigawatts, which has been set for 2030. Uh, based on renewable is really a very, very ambitious target. So it, it's just a way of uh, looking at by one person or the other. So uh, that's what the way I would think. So in each area one can get and see that these are the incremental steps which you can make to uh, reach to this. Whether it's net zero here or net zero there, it's a question of when you will be there. So ultimately India is committed in that direction, moving towards a low carbon pathways. So these are mostly Decisions which are taken at the at the top level, but the the fact is that is yes, the the central ministries, the corporates. Uh, let me also just put it in that way. So when we talk about targets, even a corporate coming to a net zero emission, we at Terry initiated a, uh, what we call it as a charter for the near zero emissions. And today we already have close to twenty large uh, corporates private sector corporates already committed to that charter that they would be net zero by close to 2050. Somebody saying 2040, somebody saying 2060, but broadly they are aligned with that. So I think that's what is important to really look at in terms of uh, the target setting uh, by the various actors. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I mean, of course you're right. This it's just two different actors setting targets, but there's one goal that we all want to reach. And a follow up to that and also related, both of you were talking a lot about industrialization and basically the potential of a green economy for a, you know, as a growth policy, essentially it's the growth strategy of the future. And I think what's important and I think the EU has already started looking at it in India. We're still towards the starting point, but there is a distributional impact of shifting from one set of policies to the other. Certain winners, certain losers, and I think again, it's we can learn from the lessons of globalization that if you don't make up for the losses, you have a backlash. And of course, we do not want to see that on the climate front. And I'd like to hear a bit from Mr. Lacasta on you know what Europe is doing and what are sort of the areas to watch out for. And then also from Mr. Sethi, because you work a lot with industry, so I think you'd have a sense of what's the sort of uh, you know like 
transitioning in industry? What are we looking at as industries of the future and how to move people there? So Mr. Lacasta first. Well, thanks. I think the issue of uh, uh, a, a fair transition has become center stage, has come to the center stage uh, as of recent years. I think people are realizing, and of course, you might have heard the so-called green vests movement in Europe, whereby you had a situation which, which was somewhat paradoxically in that uh, you had on the one hand people complaining about uh, fuel prices, but in those same uh, demonstrations, people were holding climate as the challenge of a generation. So there is indeed an issue there between realizing that uh, there will be transition costs. And the important thing for government to take into account, first and foremost, is that while they're seeing unprecedented economic transitions, they need to first and foremost realize what in those transitions are impacted by climate policy versus other natural, as it were, uh, economic developments and uh, transformations. This is a, a, a absolutely central tenet of public policy because oftentimes, and we've discussed in Europe for the last 20 years uh, about carbon leakage, in other words, Again, offshoring of production because some would argue uh, you did not have targets uh, for uh, emissions reductions in other countries. And the evidence of such carbon leakage is very scant, if at all, present. Because if you look back 20, 25, 30 years, companies didn't dislocate uh, from uh, Europe and North America because of carbon emissions. They dislocated, among other factors, because of labor factors. So, how do we, uh, in that sense, move towards these waters. And I believe that we need to have specific targeted policies and support for disfavored populations. For instance, something which we have in Europe increasingly is so-called social energy tariffs. In other words, rather than just distributing lower energy prices to everybody, and I realize it's a different socioeconomic context than many other countries, you just target those that actually are in need of direct support rather than just people that can afford it. That's number one. Number two, you need to upstream, and this is our experience, you need to really move towards lower energy prices. And again, the solar auctioning I mentioned earlier is one new way of doing so. Um, but also you need to start phasing out, and we began doing that in Europe, uh, fossil fuel subsidies. People oftentimes in Europe talk about so-called energy, renewable energy subsidies. Well, they were absolutely instrumental to getting that first generation of renewables in. Otherwise, we wouldn't have done so. And we would not have done so because the billions of euros of dollars that every year are channeled to fossil uh, uh, dependent uh, uh, industries and power gen are such that they would eclipse, you know, the hundreds of millions that renewable energy got support for in the early years. Now. We need to change that scenario because these are mature technologies and do not need public support, as I mentioned. Uh, but this was, I would argue, over the historical scale, smart policy. I think nowadays most countries don't need these, but this, but nonetheless, they still need uh, power purchase arrangements of one sort or another. That's for sure. Something else I would say, which I think is uh, uh, important. I'm seeing industry leadership that I didn't see 10 years ago or even five years ago. And I think this is relevant because I think industries for consumer purposes, for economic purposes, pushed by policies and again targets, I think it's very relevant. Every country will be different, but you, you will see that historic history will tell you that in no country you had such a massive change of behavior without clear policy. And that means targets. It could be either economy wide or sectorals and or our experience in, in Europe, as I mentioned earlier, is that emissions trading has played a central role in starting decarbonization. But of course, also policies geared towards different sectors. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier, Mr. Setti, the issue of energy efficiency. Our picture in Europe is mixed. It has been the failing uh, decarbonization policy. And it's been the failing decarbonization policy, I would argue, because it is capital. It is granular, I should say. And it's much tougher to do such a on-on-one, -on so to speak, policy rather than just sitting down a few utilities, several banks, certain policymakers, and 
charting a midterm course towards decarbonization of certain industries. And I think this is where we need to learn from each other going forward uh, uh, massively. But that doesn't detract from also investing in infrastructure, investing in home renewal. And in many countries, as one needs to invest in new buildings at a huge scale in terms of human of the human experience, uh, to the extent we can invest in, in buildings which which are more efficient, it's something which I would argue it's a win-win policy. Because if we don't we don't do that, we will be paying those costs of inefficiency later down the line, and that means again energy consumption and materials which are not amenable. So I think there's huge opportunities here to to cooperate. Perhaps later I'll speak a little bit about adaptation investments, which I think is also quite relevant here. Excellent. Thank you very much. And Mr. Sethi, over to you. But I'd just like to add on a question from Mr. Lacasta, what Mr. Lacasta said before you start, which is that uh, he was talking about the carbon pricing and trading system in in India, of course, it's different. There's no carbon price form formally, but I'd argue that industries do pay quite a heavy carbon tax de facto, despite and actually cross subsidize households, consumers, and so on. So, I mean, where do you see the potential for such a tax in India? And do you think it's useful but politically impossible or just not worth it at all? OK, thanks. I think I'll come to this point a bit later, but I think on your earlier question, which uh, you asked in terms of uh, what are the kinds of uh, what are we looking at in terms of the industries of the future? I, I would just like to put it in. Since the, the broader theme of this whole uh, discussion is green transitions, so let me try to paraphrase my response in, in that fashion. So when we are looking at these transitions, green transitions, and putting industries at the, at the center of it. What I can see is apart from energy efficiency, which we briefly touched in Mr. Lacosta also talk. I think the most important point where we one also needs to really talk about is the issue of circularity and resource efficiency. And this also would probably I would like to put include the whole issue of demand optimization and all. See the the way the policies are framed and the way they are promoted, <clears throat> things like one would not have imagined the new industries as he mentioned about one would not have imagined a few years back. Things like co-working spaces. These are being talked about so much now in India and more so during this pandemic period and people working from home or then you are going to common places. You really do not need so many office buildings. So that's where. And, and buildings are the ones which consume a lot of energy and they remain unoccupied for at least two thirds of the time because if you're working during the day and the evening time and they are not uh, they're not occupied. So things like that, the co-working spaces. This is all related to demand optimization. Whether you really need that. So these are the things which will change the whole demand patterns, which one is really not aware of it. In buildings, for example, uh, India has come out with what is called as a cooling action plan. The Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, the first country has come up. It very clearly brings out that the maximum electricity demand would actually come from cooling. India is a hot and tropical country and the temperatures reach up to 45 degree, 40 degree very often during the summer seasons. And if all the new buildings are going to be air conditioned buildings, imagine what would be the uh, cooling demand and how much of electricity is needed, even if it is assumed that it is going to come from solar. But still, one needs to really be sure that what exactly is required. Same example, one could talk about the ride sharing. This kind of industry never existed uh, a few years back. So one really doesn't know what would be the new sets of industries. Of course, one can really predict that is digitization and IoT and uh, interconnection that would really drive a lot of things. And I also personally believe that in a country which is, as I mentioned in my initial remarks, is a country which is going to grow at eight to 10 percent for the next so many years, talking about a trillion dollar, five trillion dollar economy and all that kind of things, wanting to be a developed country by so and so date. Uh, the role of logistics in warehousing, I think that's going to increase quite a lot, I think, in India. 
and today we are not uh, even the uh, uh, in many of the reports which we have seen we say that the efficiency losses which we have in these areas are huge the other kinds of industries which we can see i think is uh, i am personally quite uh, uh, sort of optimistic on something like a food processing sector being a large country with a huge agricultural base we still are way way behind and that's something which is going to grow in a big way in, in this country uh, now coming to your other point when you talked about the carbon pricing yes you are correct i think we don't have that uh, in a way but to a certain extent we know that industry really cross subsidizes uh, in india agriculture probably i think uh, many countries many people uh, around the world can't imagine that industries pay such a high tariff and cross subsidize household whereas it is in opposite in many countries in europe industries pay a lower tariff than what the households pay and in many other parts of the world we are the opposite here and i have also uh, heard some statements by the honorable uh, power minister mr rk singh maybe a year back or so and in one of the conferences he did mention that how can we think of competing with china when we can we are required to pay rupees 9 per kilowatt hour of electricity and uh, so uh, And, and that's that's the kind of thing. So to me, I think putting an additional burden on uh, industries probably I think, but I personally think it's very difficult at this stage to to imagine because we already pay such a high tariff, and uh, probably the answer lies I think in the overall structural reforms in in India which are happening in the electricity distribution sector. Uh, just for the information, I think uh, maybe you must be knowing. is this uh, very nice scheme called kusum uh, which was uh, started uh, one and a half two years back where we are talking about uh, solarizing the agricultural pump sets so the cross subsidy which is happening in india is primarily because the agriculture sector is heavily uh, does not pay those tariffs so if that can come from solar pumps and the, and uh, the discoms are able to move in that direction that will really make uh the uh, tariffs coming down and then one can really talk about those things so these are some of my initial thoughts on on this subject thank you very much and i mean i think you're absolutely right there's going to have to be a structural change not an increase in pricing but maybe get you know also consumers pay very low tran public transport rates and that's cross subsidized by industry that's another way that carbon is tax but only for industry and it's worth thinking about for india what the optimal sort of pricing plan on across all sectors of the economy should be but my last question to both of you we have about 7 minutes left is on finance and i mean mr lakasta just said he'd like to talk a little about adaptation finance but in general i think it's also important to highlight that as ambitious as you know i mean for a developing country the ambitions are limited by the amount of money on the table in front of them that they can invest and spend and there is of course the one side which is committing finance and meeting those targets whether it's the 1 billion or anything or a bigger amount but i think the second is creating the capacity within developing economies to absorb that investment effectively and put it to the right direction and i'd like to have both your thoughts on that what more can be done especially together because i think eu is committed to increasing its financing and what can india do to attract it here so mr lakasta first and then mr sethi oh well, thanks very much i think that's a huge huge challenge i would even start by saying the following i think today the financial sector is still part of the problem rather than part of the solution business schools same thing they have no clue what they're talking about when it comes to carbon investments they price them wrongly they appraise them wrongly they have they're only beginning to do risk assessment which factors in climate considerations into their portfolios so i would say let's start working with the financial sector with business schools because that's where most of the leaders that will be dealing handling our money will be coming out of uh, and uh, and they're they're ill prepared currently so that's one that's number one it seems a small step but it i tell you it very much will likely be a big step going forward number 2 uh the yeah the, the absorbing capacity of of economies and it's it's not only developing economies let me tell you portugal is a middle income country 
uh, and we're a small economy to be sure, uh, but we've been a, an interesting case over the last 20, 30 years of a country which has leaped in one generation from developing to developed sta status. In many indicators, we've, we've sort of reached that sort of holy grail of sorts, but on other uh, indicators, we're still who we are in that sense. For instance, again, the issue of targeting timetables, perhaps like a Latin country, we were you know, com somewhat averse to, to targets. But, but the realization is that they've allowed us to get on, on board and move forward. So when financing and absorbing capacity, clearly that's a huge challenge. We're seeing nowadays, for instance, with the absorption of the so-called recovery and resilience uh, EU package that all European economies will have to absorb huge amounts of cash in uh, three years that we do not have the engineering, we do not have the uh, a project, we do not have even the regulatory capacities to absorb all that financing. And yet politicians have told us you have to do so in three years. So that's a huge challenge because in a way climate policy means running against time, but yes, economies, societies are not yet prepared to these challenges. So in my view, perhaps the best way to do so is to keep on putting on, on, on at the forefront the sense of urgency. Otherwise, we sort of get complacent, number one. Number two, to start exchanging experiences amongst all of us and how the, these things can be done at scale, because a lot of us have lessons to, to share. And number three, uh, to, to be selective in, in terms of these investments. If we do the same thing as we've done the last 20, 25 years, we will not be moving forward, we'll be moving back. We'll have this sort of temporary relief in terms of money get coming into our economy, but you know, two, three years down the line, we will have a cold awakening and it, it will be an awakening that we've wasted all these resources in, uh, uh, in, in, in investments which were of the past, which were perhaps many of them uh, um, waning and rather than investing in investments of the future, again, infrastructure, uh, energy, grid, um, uh, more renewables, circularity. Another good example, we waste so much materials in our economies that we dump in waste sites rather than recycle them back onto the economy. And the reason for that is because our value chains are locked in, and also in agriculture, incidentally, in terms of synthetic fertilizers, they locked in to value chains, which clearly are all about, you know, producing and dumping uh, uh, materials. There's a long way to do that. And I think adaptation, I need to say this, if I may, in 30 seconds, is the big, big, big challenge going forward. Because we've identified the costs, most, in most cases, of decarbonization. They're fairly easily identifiable. Uh, economy wide. They're significant, but they're traditionally considered to be manageable across economies. On adaptation, we're just beginning to understand that tab, and it's likely to be an order of magnitude so much higher than that for mitigation that we need to awake on that front as well. Thank you. Thank you. Very points there and I'll just give the same question over to Mr. Sethi now because I think there's an India perspective on this which is similar in many respects but also you can maybe highlight for us the differences. No, I think I'll not elaborate much on the subject I think but I would uh, basically agree I think I'm not an expert on adaptation but I can just mention on the issue of financing and adaptation uh, Mr. Lukasa, I can just mention that just before this session uh, started we had uh, uh, Mr. Alok Sharma, the COP, uh, Glasgow COP presidency visiting Terry. So we had this lunch and meeting here and he also actually mentioned in his uh, internal meeting discussions about uh, role of adaptation, which you have just now highlighted, I think, and, and, uh, and the issue of financing and all which is coming up. So I just wanted to mention that because it just equals with generally what is being talked about. But um, on the uh, larger issue of capacities, of course, I think uh, on, on financing, uh, I just also wanted to mention, I think that there is the importance of the business models in, in countries, uh, how you really actually have those business models. I think the example which we have in India, where uh, the way uh, the LED example, which we have of light emitting diodes, how they have really helped move forward their cost reductions in India through 
through economies of scale, procuring these uh, LED bulbs in millions and driving down the cost. I think that's something very important which which is happening in India, uh, maybe a large economy and probably the same model can really work uh, wonders when one talks about how ISA is going to move forward in when they're talking about the solar banks and all those things when we want to move towards those whether it's lanterns or whether it is solar pumps across the world. So not just in India. That's all. Thanks. Thank you very much, both of you. I think this conversation could continue on, but we have to stop here. Unfortunately, a lot to take away, I think, especially on the scope for cooperation, but also I think the big sort of um, similarities and differences in the European and Indian experience. And it's somehow it's uh, heartening to know that the absorption problem is everywhere in the world because there is a lot of money out there, whether private or public, but we need to build more avenues to absorb it. The idea you had, Mr. Sethi, on you know expanding government procurement or trying to build up economies of scale in one sector at a time, of course, is what's happening so far. We just need to find, I guess, identify those sectors and start scaling them up very, very quickly. But uh, I was very glad to have both of you here, and I hope we can continue this conversation with the Portuguese Embassy and the partnership that we've started. Thank you again very much for joining and have a good evening, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bert.